Mediacorp now brings you live our coverage of the state funeral for Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, Singapore's founding prime minister. The man a nation has been mourning for, Singapore's founding father and master strategist, the architect of modern Singapore. A man who lived through the British colonial era, the Japanese occupation, the struggle for independence, and the transformation of Singapore from a backwater to a first world nation. I'm Augustine Atwan. And I'm Glenda Chong. Here, at Singapore's Parliament House and across the country, state flags have been flown at half-mast for seven days as a mark of respect to Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. His name is synonymous with modern Singapore. A man who not only shaped the future of the tiny island state, but was also one of the region's most respected leaders, whose views were sought around the world. Leaders from all over the world have gathered in Singapore today to pay their final respects to this man who led his country and dedicated his life to Singapore. As they gather at the University Cultural Centre, foreign dignitaries, different ASEAN leaders and representatives of various countries have gathered for the last farewell to Mr. Lee. In the words of Dr. Henry Kissinger, former US Secretary of State, Mr. Lee was one of the most able foresighted and analytical global leaders of the last half century. Showers across several parts of Singapore where Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's state funeral procession will pass through. The crowds who turned up early to line the roads, braving the downpour with their umbrellas and ponchos. Some stayed overnight, while others arrived as early as six this morning. Singaporeans from all walks of life have come together today, holding the state flag, waiting patiently. The sense of national loss, but at the same time of gratefulness, of respect, and of wanting to do something to thank Mr. Lee for his sacrifices for the nation. Many Singaporeans have lined up along the streets today to wait for the cortege to pass and to wave and say a final farewell to Mr. Lee. The entire 15.4 kilometer route is lined with those who have waited and some holding the national flag.
Mr. Lee was born on 16th September 1923 and became Singapore's first Prime Minister at the age of 35, a post he held till he stepped down on 28th November 1990. He was 91 years old when he died on Monday, 23rd March at 3.18 a.m. at the Singapore General Hospital. Pictures now of the crowd standing by outside Singapore Polytechnic. This is the third lying in state at Parliament House, an iconic landmark. Parliament House is a place of great significance. Mr. Lee was an elected representative of the residents of Tanjung Paga for 60 years, from 1955 to 2015. And many of the country's landmark legislations were debated in the House which have charted the future of the nation. Over the past four days, Singaporeans from all walks of life have gathered here to pay their last respects to Mr Lee. Over 100,000 a day, all in some half a million people lined up to say farewell. And at other tribute sites around the island, nearly one million turned up. And later, the casket of the former Prime Minister will be transferred onto the ceremonial 25-pounder gun carriage. The Speaker of the House will send off the gun carriage from the entrance to the driveway, signifying the end of the lying in state ceremony. The procession of vehicles following the casket will then make its way to the University Cultural Centre where the state funeral service will be held. Family members, the President, Cabinet members, members of Parliament, the judiciary, former politicians, the diplomatic corps will all attend the service. It also includes Singaporeans from all walks of life those whose lives have been touched by Mr. Lee, who will gather at the University Cultural Centre from noon and the funeral service will begin at 2 p.m. A little bit more information on what will be coming later. At the University Cultural Centre, leaders from more than 20 countries will attend alongside family members and invited guests for the state funeral. Among them, the inter-religious organization. Members of parliament have already arrived. Despite the heavy downpour, Singaporeans standing outside the Singapore Recreation Club along St Andrews Road. No words can express the resilience of these people who are standing firm in silence 
waiting patiently for the cortege that will pass through these streets as it makes its way towards University Cultural Centre. The proceedings at Parliament House will start at 12.30. All along the route, from Parliament House to the University Cultural Centre, special arrangements have been made to make way for the state funeral procession. The motorcade will travel from Parliament House through the Civic District towards Old Parliament House. It will pass the former Supreme Court and City Hall, now the National Gallery, the Padang, St Andrew's Cathedral, the War Memorial Park, the Esplanade, Marina Bay and Marina Barrage, Fullerton Hotel, and on to Singapore Conference Hall, into Tanjung Baga, past the pinnacle at Duxton, the police cantonment complex, the Singapore General Hospital, along Bukit Merah, past CPIB, down Queensway, the Singapore Polytechnic, and finally make its way towards the University Cultural Centre. Singaporeans have started to line these streets to catch a glimpse of the cottage as it passes the area to bid a final farewell to Mr. Lee. Some have also gathered around the 18 designated public sites for Singaporeans to express their sorrow, but also to celebrate Mr. Lee's life. And all this despite the heavy rain. Many have come prepared with their umbrellas holding the state flag, some even holding pictures of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, all standing patiently waiting along St. Andrew's Road, Stamford Road, near Parliament House, when the state funeral procession will begin at 12.30. There appears to be a palpable sense of togetherness as they wait patiently together for the cortege to pass. Mr. Lee was one of the founders of the People's Action Party in 1954 and was its Secretary General until November 1992. He delivered many stirring speeches in Parliament House as a representative of Tanjung Paga from 2nd April 1955 and has represented Tanjung Paga for 60 years. Mr. Lee always made an effort to listen to backbenchers speak, even after he stepped down as Prime Minister. Whilst he made fewer speeches in the House in his later years, he would speak whenever he felt strongly about an issue, particularly when he felt he needed to help his Cabinet colleagues carry public opinion.
Singaporeans standing patiently despite the rain, dressed in their ponchos, holding their umbrellas, many holding the state flag, men, women, children, senior citizens, all waiting patiently along Shenton Way for that opportunity to bid a final farewell to Mr. Lee. The Singapore Armed Forces will bid Mr. Lee a final farewell with the highest honours. Later, when the gun carriage carries Mr. Lee's body from Parliament House, there will be a 21-gun salute fired by four ceremonial 25-pounder guns as the procession journeys around the Padang. This honour is usually reserved only for sitting heads of state. Four RSAF Black Knights will also salute Mr. Lee as his body passes City Hall. They will form the missing man formation where one aircraft will break away from the four aircraft flying formation as an aerial salute to honour Mr. Lee. And from the Republic of Singapore Navy and Police Coast Guard, a sail passed. Two fearless class patrol vessels the RSS Dauntless and RSS Resilience from the Republic of Singapore Navy and two PH class vessels from the Police Coast Guard will conduct a ceremonial sail past off the Marina Barrage as a final salute set against the backdrop of the city skyline. Just outside Parliament House, the Singapore Armed Forces Central Band and the Guard of Honour contingents taking up position. The procession will begin at Parliament House and the cortege will be led by four Guard of Honour contingents from the Singapore Armed Forces and the Singapore Police Force. The ceremonial gun carriage attachment is formed by soldiers from the Singapore Artillery. The use of a ceremonial gun carriage for state funerals is a practice inherited from the British. The custom can be traced back to the 1800s. The gun carriage has since been adopted as a dignified way to carry the casket and has become an accepted part of state and military funerals. Students, at Northbridge Road, braving the rain. Emotions clearly on their faces. Waiting patiently for the cortege to pass. We are now 20 minutes into our live coverage. of the state funeral for Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, Singapore's founding Prime Minister.
And here's more information on the gun carriage. It consists of three parts, the ceremonial Land Rover, the Limber and the gun carriage. The casket will be carried on the gun carriage connected to the Limber. The Limber is a two-wheeled vehicle to which the gun trail is attached. The gun carriage consists of a 25-pounder howitzer gun on which is mounted a tempered glass case for the casket. Accompanying the casket is the coffin bearer party led by Brigadier General Melvin Ong, Chief Guards Officer. Thousands of Singaporeans have gathered along the street, just outside Parliament House, stretching along the Padang, waiting patiently to witness the state funeral procession and to pay tribute to the former Prime Minister. Some have been waiting since this morning from six in the morning, even though they know the hearse bearing Mr. Lee's body will not arrive until 12.30 in the afternoon. Among those in attendance are many from the pioneer generation, senior citizens who have witnessed the birth of Singapore, made sacrifices along the way and contributed to Singapore's development from third world to first alongside Mr. Lee. We observe this final journey today of Mr. Lee through the Civic District and through key landmarks in the city, which have figured prominently in Singapore's history. Heavy rain falling across several parts of Singapore, where Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's state funeral procession will pass through. Young and old braving the downpour with their umbrellas and ponchos. This brings to mind the event of the National Day Parade when it rained heavily back in the 1960s and people stood by resilient. And today, once again, we are witnessing Singaporeans from all walks of life standing firm, resolute, holding on to their umbrellas, holding on to the state flag, waiting patiently along various stretches of the street. In that National Day Parade in 1968, Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew, Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong was standing also in the Padang in the rain. In the past few days, 
cabinet colleagues and fellow parliamentarians alike, foreign friends, relatives, had been streaming in at Parliament House to pay their last respects to the late Mr Lee. Some details here of the pallbearers who will be sending Mr Lee off from Parliament House. The eight pallbearers are former members of Parliament. Mr Mahmoud Awang, the first chairman of the National Trades Union Congress who represented Kampong Kapoor from 1963 to 1968. Mr. Current MPs, Dr. Ng Eng Hen, Defence Minister and Leader of the House. Mr. Chan Chi Singh, MP for Jalan Basar from 1959 to 1962, 1982. He was also the government whip in the crucial 1960s and 1970s and a pillar of strength for Mr. Lee and his colleagues. Mr. Cham Si Tong, Secretary General of the Opposition Singapore People's Party, who was MP for Potong Parse from 1984 to 2011. Among the current MPs, Mr. Mohammad Maliki, Minister of State for National Development and Defence. Ms. Josephine Teo, Senior Minister of State for Finance and Transport. Mr. Kathy Kayen, a veteran union leader and Vice President of the National Trades Union Congress. And Mr. Gan Kim Yong, Health Minister and Government Whip. It was Mr. Lee who mooted for the nominated Member of Parliament scheme in 1990 to bring independent voices into the Singapore Parliament. All eight pallbearers will form up and accompany the cortege as it slowly begins to move out of Parliament House for the state funeral procession. The gun carriage consists of three parts, the ceremonial Land Rover, the Limber and the gun carriage. The casket will be carried on the gun carriage connected to the Limber. The Limber is a two-wheeled vehicle to which the gun trail is attached. The gun carriage consists of a 25-pounder howitzer gun on which is mounted a tempered glass case for the casket. The use of the ceremonial gun carriage for state funerals is a practice inherited from the British. You're joining us for the special coverage of the state funeral for founding Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. It is now 12.30. Brigadier General Melvin Ong leads the Coffin Bearer Party of Eight and are proceeding to carry the casket towards the gun carriage. The casket of the late Mr. Lee Kuan Yew is draped in the state flag to accord him the highest honour. The Singapore flag is draped over the casket so that the crescent and stars lie over the head and close to the heart. 
The state flag is not allowed to touch the ground. It drapes the casket throughout the state funeral service. It serves as the highest mark of honour for one of modern Singapore's founding fathers. The cap orderlies are now assisting with the removal of the caps of the coffin bearer party. The Coffin Bearer Party is made up of eight senior officers from the Singapore Armed Forces and the Singapore Police Force. The Coffin Barrier Party are now in formation and they are starting to move slowly, carrying the body of late Mr. Lee Kuan Yew and will proceed towards the foyer, the entrance of Parliament House, where the gun carriage is waiting. Bearers are now accompanying the coffin bearer party as they slowly begin to move out of Parliament House. Eight senior officers from the SAF and the Singapore Police Force are part of a coffin bearer party, led by Brigadier General Melvin Ong, Chief Guards Officer. The national flag draped over the casket, symbolizing the country's recognition of Mr. Lee's contributions to the country.
Over the past few days, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's body has been lying in state at Parliament House, located within Singapore's city centre. The gates of Parliament House were opened to the public on Wednesday, 25th March, and over the last four days, almost half a million have been coming by to pay their respects. And in the past week, about 170 foreign dignitaries from about 27 countries, regions and international organizations turned up for the lying in state at Parliament House. The Coffin Bearer Party has placed the body of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew onto the gun carriage, and now they're preparing the gun carriage for the foot procession as they slowly move out of Parliament House towards the main gate. The ceremonial gun carriage bearing the body of former Prime Minister Mr Lee Kuan Yew will make its final journey through the city centre. The funeral procession will move at about 25 kilometres per hour to travel the 15.4 kilometre route from Parliament House to the University Cultural Centre. The procession will take about one hour. In the procession is the chief mourner, Prime Minister Lee Sien Long, and family members. The coffin bearer party now slowly making their way, the foot procession has just begun. Accompanying the family members are eight pallbearers sending Mr. Lee off from Parliament House. Mr. Chum Si Tong, Secretary General of the Opposition Singapore People's Party and who was MP for Potong Parser from 1984 to 2011. Mr. Chan Chi Seng, who was also the government whip in the crucial 1960s and 1970s. Mr. Mahmud Awang, the first chairman of the National Trades Union Congress. Among the current MPs, Mr. Gun Kim Yong, Health Minister and Government Whip.
as the coffin-bearer party slowly makes its way towards the main gate of Parliament House. The mood here is sombre, quiet and reflective as Singaporeans wait patiently for the coffin of Mr Lee Kuan Yew to come out from Parliament House. Among the other pallbearers accompanying the coffin bearer party, Dr. Ng Eng Hen, Defence Minister and Leader of the House. Ms. Josephine Teo. And Mr. Mohammad Maliki. As the foot procession continues at the corner of Northbridge Road and Parliament Place, students and military personnel are lining the street along Parliament Place, St Andrews Road, Stamford Road and Esplanade Drive to bid a final farewell to Mr Lee. Just nearby, at the Padang, ceremonial guns from the Singapore Artillery are standing by for the firing of a 21-gun salute in honour of the late Prime Minister. The firing of the 21-rounds gun salute is a time-honoured tradition at state funerals. These 25-pounder ceremonial guns are from the 23rd Battalion Singapore Artillery. The last gun will be fired when the convoy reaches the Esplanade. Crowd, waving their flags and calling out Mr. Lee's name as the cortege passes.
as the state funeral procession makes its way slowly down towards North Ridge Road towards the Padang. The Guard of Honor contingent, made up of Army, Navy, Air Force and the Singapore Police Force, accompanied by the Singapore Armed Forces Central Band. In just a short while, the first of 21 rounds of gun salute will be fired. Crowds have gathered to witness significant moments in Singapore's political history. Crowds gathered along the stretch of Shenton Way, pa waiting patiently for the funeral cortege to pass by. Heavy rains, the skies too are crying for Mr. Lee. Reflection of the mood of Mr. Lee's family, the people and our nation. The people gathered around Padang, who just a short while ago were calling out Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's name, are all now silent. The first round has just been fired.
48 personnel from the Singapore Armed Forces and Singapore Police Force in ceremonial unimogs, forming the escort for the gun carriage as it slowly makes its way towards the Padang. Four RSAF Black Knights flew past with the missing man formation in the shape of a V. Crowds have gathered on the Padang to witness significant moments in Singapore's political history. The bad weather not deterring, deter, deterring them from coming out. With the ninth gown salute, people cheering, waving the Singapore flag. as the coffin bearer party moves past and moves towards the memorial park. The civilian war memor memorial on the left of the Coffin Barra party. The monument was unveiled by Mr. Lee, then Prime Minister, on 15th February 1967, the 25th anniversary of the fall of Singapore. Since then, a memorial service is held every year on February 15th to commemorate the day in 1942 when Singapore fell to the Japanese. As the 21-gun salute continues, the funeral cortege is slowly making its way towards the esplanade. Reclamation in the 1990s extended and connected Elizabeth Walk to Marina Bay, setting the stage for the new performing arts venue, the Esplanade Theatres on the Bay. Mr. Lee Kuan Yew had mooted the idea of damming up the Marina Basin to create a massive freshwater lake. Twenty years later, technology made his vision feasible. In 2008, the Marina Reservoir Singapore's 15th was formed. And as Mr. Lee's body crosses the Esplanade Bridge, 
Fearless class patrol vessels RSS Dauntless and RSS Resilience from the Singapore Navy and two PH class patrol vessels Hammerhead Shark and Mako Shark from the Police Coast Guard are conducting a ceremonial sail pass off the marina barrage. On each ship, a black flag is flown on the starboard side of the mast, together with signal flags representing the letters L, K and Y. Dressed in ceremonial uniform, personnel line the vessel's decks, standing at attention to salute Mr. Lee, bowing their heads to observe a minute of silence. The ships will sound three prolonged horns. As the funeral cortege passes the Fullerton Hotel, Singaporeans cheering, waving the national flag. And opposite is the Fullerton Hotel, which used to be the general post office. Fullerton Square, just nearby, was the site from 1959 to 1988 of many of Mr. Lee's landmark election rally speeches. Mr. Lee also remembered the general post office as the location of Singapore's first industrial strike after the colonial government introduced emergency regulations in June 1948. Mr. Lee represented the postal workers as their legal advisor and drafted their statements. It was to be a turning point for him, his first union work, as the resolution of the strike led to other unions asking him to represent them. And it would bring him into the political spotlight and head-on clashes with the then colonial government. Very moving images and sounds of crowds shouting emotionally, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. The funeral cortege is slowly making its way down Shenton Way. Nothing seems to deter the people of Singapore as they stand resolute. The rain is pouring on and yet they're shouting, waving their flags, cheering on. They're shouting Lee Kuan Yew, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. Cottage passing Raffles Place, where Commercial Square once stood. Singapore's first trading community was made up of the earliest banks, trading houses and large departmental stores. By the late 1970s, the Central Business District stretched into Shenton Way and became the area where Singapore's banks were located. The funeral cortege is slowly making its way towards the Singapore Conference Hall, which has witnessed several historic events. During the general elections, it has been a nomination and counting centre for several constituencies, including Mr. Lee's Tanjung Baga Award. Several memorable post-election news conferences were held here by Mr. Lee and subsequent People's Action Party leaders. You can almost hear in the background as the crowds are cheering the music of All Lang Syne.
As the procession enters Capel Road, Singaporeans may remember that Mr. Lee was a familiar face in the area. He represented the Singapore Harbour Board Staff Association, now known as the Singapore Port Workers' Union in the 1950s. As legal advisor to the port workers, Mr. Lee had recommended the reorganization and merger of the labor unions to enjoy better bargaining power. Emotional scenes here as crowds are throwing flowers onto the street, many waving the Singapore flag, despite the heavy rain downpour, standing resolute and cheering on. More people throwing flowers onto the street as the funeral cortege passes by Capel. The funeral cortege is now passing by the port area and slowly turning off onto towards Duxton and Pinnacle. The funeral cortege is now slowly moving into a very special part of Singapore, linked closely to Mr. Lee, Tanjung Baga, his constituency, where he served for 60 years. Crowds of Singaporeans at Maritime House waiting patiently, holding flowers, holding the national flag just across the street, Pinnacle at Duxton, a very special area for Mr. Lee. This is his constituency, whom he served for 60 years. Many of the residents are now standing, watching and waiting as the funeral cortege will pass in just a short while. When Mr. Lee first stood for election here, he explained that he chose Tanjung Paga because he wanted to represent workers, wage earners and small traders, not wealthy merchants or landlords. He won resoundingly, with 78% of the votes, despite it being a three-cornered fight. In the 1963 election campaign, he again promised voters something he delivered, and which has become a symbol of progress for Singapore. Two blocks of HDB flats were completed after the election in 1964 on Duxton Plain. The people of Tanjung Bagh are cheering, children among them holding flowers, waving the national flag, calling out his name, Mr Lee Kuan Yew. Today, historic site stands the award-winning Pinnacle at Duxton. There are not enough words to express what these people are experiencing. Residents of Tanjung Baga who have a deep, deep connection to Mr. Lee. Today, they bid their final farewell to their MP. At its groundbreaking ceremony in 1995 at Tanjung Paga Plaza, then Senior Minister Lee said the government's plan to upgrade older housing board estates was an ambitious program which would transform Singapore dramatically over the next 20 years. To residents of Tanjung Paga, he made his promise. Quote, in 20 years, you will see a spanking Singapore equal to the transformation that you have experienced in Tanjung Paga Plaza in the last 20 years." End quote. Mr. Lee would make good 
that promise. The GRC, which is home to some of the oldest buildings and housing estates, has experienced the fastest and most extensive changes to its landscape and skyline. The funeral cortege is slowly making its way past the police cantonment complex and many Singaporeans who have been waiting in the rain, literally on their knees, waving their flags as the body of Mr. Lee makes its way towards the Singapore General Hospital. Newbridge Road, built in 1842, is named after Coleman's New Bridge, which was constructed over the Singapore River in 1840. The road is closely associated with the history of Chinatown. It was the meeting place of Chinese immigrants. Clan associations and Chinese movie theatres made this street a second home for these immigrants. People holding up boards and pictures of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew with words saying thank you for giving your life to Singapore. Just past Newbridge Road and working towards Kampong Bahru, just outside the Singapore General Hospital, many, including Singaporeans and hospital staff, have turned up standing quietly, lining the street towards Kampong Bahru. Mr. Lee was admitted to the Singapore General Hospital on February 5th with severe, severe pneumonia and died on Monday, 23rd March. Staff here have a special connection to Mr. Lee, having had to care for him and Mrs. Lee over the years. Along Jalan Bukit Mera stands the first Sikh temple to be built in Singapore. Sikhism is one of the ten religions represented in the inter-religious organization Singapore. The current inter-religious organization council is made up of 31 members who are constituent members of ten religions. Singapore's commitment to meritocracy regardless of race, language and religion, were key tenets on which the nation was founded. Key beliefs of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew and his fellow Old Guard leadership. We are now into an hour and 15 minutes of our coverage of the state funeral procession. Just passing by, making its way towards Jalan Bukit Mera. Here we are now along Jalan Bukit Merah. The high-rise flats along the road today. It is hard to imagine that villages with attap huts were common before the first blocks of government flats were built in 1955. By the 1960s, emergency flats in standard one-room, two-room, three-room configurations sprouted to house a growing population. Crowds just shouting out Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's name as the funeral cortege makes its way along this stretch of Jalan Bukit Nara off Silat Road.
crowds crying out his name, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, we love you. The funeral cortege still making its way slowly down Jalan Bukit Merah. Housing was a key priority when Mr. Lee and his team took office. There was a severe shortage. People lived in slums in the city, particularly in Chinatown, with poor sanitation. Fires had devastated several large precincts where people were living in wooden shacks in kampongs. He famously said he would transform Singapore from mud flats to metropolis. And a key part of that would be to build housing for the people. He believed that owning a home would give Singaporeans a stake in the country and its future, so they would own part of Singapore and would then care more for the community. Crowds of Singaporeans waving bouquets of flowers, calling out Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's name as the funeral cortege continues to make its way down Jalan Mukit Merah. The funeral cortege passing by the former headquarters of the Housing Development Board. Crowds cheering on. People throwing flower petals onto the road, waving the national flag. Truly, there are not enough words to express what is happening right now. This major outpouring. We're now one hour, 20 minutes into our live broadcast. As the funeral cortege slowly makes its way down Jalan Bukit Merah, nearby an institution closely linked to Mr. Lee and his government's tough stance on corruption, 
The Corrupt Practices Investigations Bureau, CPID, is an independent body responsible for the investigation and prevention of corruption in Singapore. Anti-corruption laws were inadequate and this had hindered the gathering of evidence against corrupt individuals. The situation changed after the People's Action Party came into power in 1959. Public confidence in the CPID grew as people realized the government was sincere in its anti-corruption drive. Mr. Lee Kuan Yew laid that firm foundation that still remains today. Crowds shouting and cheering for Mr. Lee. As the state funeral procession slowly continues to make its way towards Queensway and Tangden Halt. Just past Brickworks Estate, Singaporeans calling out Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's name as the funeral cortege and the military escort make its way towards the University Cultural Centre for the state funeral service. The procession now entering Queensway. A majority of the larger estates called New Towns were being developed as self-contained communities with not only the essential facilities to meet the residents' basic needs, but also various community amenities such as schools and recreational facilities.
The funeral cortege has just passed Queensway, making its way slowly towards Tanglin Halt. Amongst the numerous community facilities one sees in Singapore's new towns are places of worship, representing the diversity of Singapore's population. calling out Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's name. The flag-draped coffin is now making its way towards Blessed Sacrament Church, Sri Muniswaran Temple and Masjid Mujahideen Mosque. It is not unusual in multi-ethnic, multi-religious Singapore to have places of worship of different religions side by side. funeral cortege slowly making its way past Tanglin Halt estate. People waiting patiently. The rain continues to pour on, but Singaporeans stand firm waving their flags, throwing flower petals onto the street, calling out Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's name. In just a short while, the funeral cortege will turn slowly right and on to Commonwealth. Singaporeans, young and old, have gathered along the streets to bid a final farewell. Here at Commonwealth Avenue, you can hear the crowds crying out his name, Lee Kuan Yew, as the cortege passes by. Many among them senior citizens bowing their heads as a mark of respect as the funeral cortege slowly makes its way down Commonwealth Avenue, moving on towards University Cultural Centre. Also standing as a silent witness along with Singaporeans are the huge trees and shrubs, closely linked to Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's legacy. He is also known as the chief gardener of Singapore. It all began when he planted 
a Mumpa tree at Farris Circus on June 16, 1963. And since then, it has become an annual tradition called Tree Planting Day. Some 1.4 million trees have been planted along Singapore's roads and across the country's past parks in the past 50 years. Mr. Lee saw the greening of Singapore as a way to distinguish it as a first world oasis in a third world region. Today, almost 50% of Singapore is covered with greenery. Mr. Lee called greening the most cost-effective project he had ever launched. We're now along Holland Rise, about Commonwealth Avenue, one hour, 30 minutes into our live coverage of the state funeral procession for the late Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. Crowds of Singaporeans, young and old, different races, all standing together, braving the rain, holding the national flag, waving the flag as the funeral cortege passes by. Once again, Singaporeans throwing petals, flowers, waving the flag, calling out Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's name.
the crowds with a large banner that says, thank you. And you can hear them singing, we are Singapore. The funeral cortege continuing to move along Commonwealth Avenue West, working its way towards the Singapore Polytechnic. On the right of the screen, Singapore Polytechnic Gates, the first Singapore Polytechnic. The 37-hectare campus Dover, Dover Road campus cost $42 million to build and was officially opened by Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew in 1979, the culmination of five years of work and planning. Crowds along this stretch holding balloons with a black ribbon as a mark of respect printed on it, waving the balloons and the flags. All of them braving the rain, having waited patiently for the past hour or so to bid a final farewell to Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. At Singapore Polytechnic's opening, Mr. Lee said that Singapore must strive to get more students into tertiary institutions of learning without lowering entrance standards and that teaching should be for what is relevant to the needs of tomorrow, not of yesterday. The funeral cortege is slowly moving towards the final stretch of the procession, moving towards Clementi. And here, a special line of honor of military soldiers standing in salute.
From Clemente Road, the motorcade will pass landmarks such as the National University of Singapore at Kent Ridge and Nian Polytechnic. Line of honor of soldiers leading up to the road to the University Cultural Center. The cortege now moving towards the National University of Singapore. The University Cultural Center officially opened on 5th September 2000, and it has been the venue for several of Prime Minister's National Day rallies, a key event in the political calendar where the Prime Minister addresses the nation. Located on the picturesque landscapes of Kent Ridge, the University Cultural Center serves as a vibrant, innovative performing arts venue for high-quality events. The line of honor along the final stretch of the procession, mounted by 48 military policemen from the Singapore Armed Forces Military Police Command, led by Lieutenant Colonel Mark Tan, who heads the plans branch at Headquarters 2nd People's Defense Forces. As the procession passes through, the military policemen inverted their rifles and bowed their heads as a mark of respect. Known as resting on arms reversed, it signifies the paying of the highest respect to Mr. Lee. Sixteen pallbearers receiving Mr. Lee at the University Cultural Centre. They include cabinet colleagues, Deputy Prime Minister Thaman Shamugaratnam. Mr. Lim Sui Se, NTUC Secretary General and Minister in the Prime Minister's Office. Other pallbearers include members of the Labour Movement. Mr. John DePeva, the longer serving president of the National Trades Union Congress, the umbrella body for trade unions in Singapore. Another veteran union, unionist, Ms. Diana Chia, current president of the NTUC. Others who served Singapore in different capacities and represented how Mr. Lee has helped to build a safe, secure and harmonious Singapore 
include Ambassador at Large Chan Ing Chi, who was Singapore's longest serving ambassador to the United States. Retired Staff Sergeant Mr. Kang Lai Taik. Samuel Lee. Mr. Gurmit Singh. President of the Interreligious Organization. Other pall bearers include Mr. Pok Xiong Fu, who contributed to the building of the first MRT lines in the 70s and 80s. Chairman of the National Water Agency, or PUB, Mr. Tang Gi Pao. From Education, Mr. Wong Siu Hung, who will be the Director General of Education. The grandsons of the late Mr. Lee Kuan Yew holding the photo of Mr. Lee. All the grandchildren standing together. The coffin bearer party now moving into position for the final stage of the state funeral procession. The officers who form the coffin bearer party have removed their ceremonial caps and they are led by Brigadier General Ong Zichin, Commander, 3rd Division. Preparing to transfer the coffin from the gun carriage, they will then proceed to shoulder the casket into the University Cultural Centre. Also among the pallbearers, Ms. Kuratu Ain Binte Amin Nurashid, who has received the Lee Kuan Yew Scholarship to encourage upgrading. Ms. Lim Hui Ling, a nurse at the Singapore General Hospital. Ms. Dorothy Han from Keppel Fells, one of Singapore's largest companies which builds mobile offshore rigs. Ms. Anne Marie Leong, a stewardess with Singapore Airlines and representing Mr. Lee's achievements in greening Singapore, Mr. Wong Tuan Hua, Director for Conservation at End Parks, who oversees Mr. Lee's beloved Istana Gardens. From Education, Mr. Wong Siu Hung, who will be the Director General of Education and was once Headmaster of Raffles Institution.
combined band from the Singapore Armed Forces and the Singapore Police Force performing George Frederick Handel's The Dead March from Seoul. Inside the University Cultural Centre, leaders from more than 20 countries alongside family members and invited guests. Members of the media and inter-religious organization in attendance. As the coffin bearer party slowly makes its way into the hall of the University Cultural Center, Samuel Barber's Adagio is being played. World leaders in attendance waiting for the service to start. In just a short while, ten eulogies will be read. The first will be by Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong. Followed by President Dr. Tony Tan and Emeritus Senior Minister Go Chok Tong. Old Guard colleague Mr. of Mr. Lee, Ong Pang Bun. Former Cabinet Minister S. Danabalan. Former Senior Minister of State Sidek Sanef. Unionist G. Muthukuro Masami. Tanjambaga community leader Leong Chun Lun, former journalist Cassandra Chu, and finally Mr. Lee Sien Yang, younger son of Mr. Lee.
The master of ceremony to lead the state funeral is Singapore's head of the civil service, Mr. Peter Rong, who has been head since 2010. Singapore Symphony Orchestra playing this very moving rendition of Samuel Barber's Adagio. The mood is pensive and somber as all who have gathered at the University Cultural Centre are waiting for the service to begin. Amongst those who have gathered, world leaders, former cabinet colleagues, members of parliament, specially invited guests and students. MPs past and present and cabinet ministers gathered here at the University Cultural Center. State wreaths will be laid. The first state wreath will be presented by Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong. The second wreath by President Dr. Tony Tan. After the ten eulogies have been read, the lone bugler from the SAF military band will sound the last post, marking the end of the day's labour and the start of the night's rest. It represents a final salute to Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. The public warning system siren will sound for 15 seconds to rally all in Singapore to observe a minute of silence and sound again after the minute of silence. Following that, the rouse will be sounded, a call back to duty after respect has been paid to the memory of Mr. Lee. Singaporeans across the island will recite the national pledge and sing the national anthem.
As the coffin bearer party enters the hall at a slow pace, later on it will be accompanied by J.S. Bach's air from Orchestral Suite No. 3 in D major, performed by the Singapore Symphony Orchestra. Leaders from more than 20 countries, alongside family members and invited guests. From the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, Brunei Sultan Hassan al Bolkir, Indonesia President Joko Widodo, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi and flags in India and New Zealand will also today fly at half-mast. Former U.S. President Bill Clinton, Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott, Cambodian Prime Minister Hun Sen.
Please be seated. Family of the late Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, Mr. President, Prime Minister, Majesties, Presidents, Governor Generals, Prime Ministers and honoured guests, Singaporeans who are in this hall, and Singaporeans who are watching this from all over Singapore and from overseas. We are gathered here this afternoon to pay our last respects to the late Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, who left us on 23rd March 2015. The Prime Minister will now deliver his eulogy. President Tony Tan, friends, family, and fellow Singaporeans. This has been a dark week for Singapore. The light that has guided us all these years has been extinguished. We've lost our founding father, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, who lived and breathed Singapore all his life. He and his team led our pioneer generation to create this island nation, Singapore. Mr. Lee did not set out to be a politician, let alone a statesman as a boy. In fact, his grandfather wanted him to become an English gentleman. But events left an indelible mark on him. He'd been a British subject in colonial Singapore. He'd survived hardship, danger, and fear in the Japanese occupation. These life experiences drove him to fight for independence. In one of his radio talks on the Battle of Merger many years ago in 1961, Mr. Lee said, my colleagues and I are of that generation of young men who went through the Second World War and the Japanese occupation and emerged determined that no one, neither the Japanese nor the British, had the right to push and kick us around. Mr. Lee championed independence for Singapore through merger with Malaya to form a new federation, the Federation of Malaysia. He worked tirelessly to bring this about and succeeded. Unfortunately, the merger did not last, and before long, we were expelled from Malaysia. Separation was his greatest moment of anguish, but it also proved to be the turning point in Singapore's fortunes. From the ashes of separation, he built a nation. The easiest thing to do would have been to appeal to Chinese voters alone, after all, Singapore had had to leave Malaysia because we were majority Chinese. Instead, Mr. Lee went for the nobler dream of a multiracial, multireligious nation. Singapore would not be based on race, language, or religion, but on fundamental values, multiracialism, equality, meritocracy, integrity, and rule of law. Mr. Lee declared 
This is not a country that belongs to any single community. It belongs to all of us. He checked would-be racial chauvinists and assured the minorities that their place here was secure. He insisted on keeping our mother tongues, even as English became our common working language. He encouraged each group to maintain its culture, faith and language while gradually enlarging the common space shared by all. Together with Mr. S. Rajaratnam, he enshrined these ideals in the National Pledge. He kept us safe in a dangerous and tumultuous world. With Dr. Go Keng Sui, he built the SAF from just two infantry battalions and one little wooden ship into a well-trained, well-equipped, well-respected fighting force. He introduced national service and personally persuaded parents to entrust their sons to the SAF. He succeeded, first, because he led by example. His two sons did NS, just like every Singaporean son. In fact, my brother and I signed up as regulars in the SAF, Tan Jiak Bing. And we went in on SAF scholarships. Secondly, people trusted Mr. Lee, and they believe in the Singapore cause. And therefore, today, we sleep peacefully at night, confident that we are well protected. Mr. Lee gave us courage to face an uncertain future. He was a straight talker, and he never shied away from hard truths, either to himself or to Singaporeans. His ministers would sometimes urge him to soften the tone of his draft speeches. Even I would sometimes do that. To sound less unyielding to human frailties. And often he took in their amendments, but he would preserve his core message. As he said, I always try to be correct, not politically correct. He was a powerful speaker moving, inspiring, persuasive in English and Malay and by dint of a lifelong hard slog in Mandarin and even Hokkien. Media Corp has been broadcasting his old speeches on TV this week, reminding us that his was the original Singapore roar, passionate, formidable and indomitable. Above all, Lee Kuan Yew was a fighter. In crisis, when all seemed hopeless, he was ferocious, endlessly resourceful, firm in his resolve, and steadfast in advancing his cause. And thus he saw us through many battles, the battle for merger against the communists, which most people thought the non-communists would lose. The fight when we were in Malaysia against the communists when his own life was in danger. Separation which cast us out into a hazardous world. And then the withdrawal of the British military forces from Singapore, which threatened the livelihoods of 150,000 people. Because he never wavered, we didn't falter. Because he fought, we took courage and fought with him and prevailed. And thus, Mr. Lee took Singapore and took us all from the third world to the first. In many countries, anti-colonial fighters and heroes would win independence and assume power, but then fail, fail at nation building because the challenges of bringing a society together, growing an economy, patiently improving people's lives are very different from the challenges of fighting for independence, mobilizing crowds, getting people excited, overthrowing a regime. But Mr. Lee and his team succeeded at nation building. Just weeks after separation, Mr. Lee boldly declared that 
Ten years from now, this will be a metropolis. Never fear. And indeed, he made it happen. He instilled discipline and order, ensuring that in Singapore, every problem gets fixed. He educated our young. He transformed labour relations from strikes and confrontation to tripartism and cooperation. He campaigned to upgrade skills and to raise productivity, calling this effort a marathon with no finish line. He enabled his economic team, Go King Sui, Hon Sui Sen, Lim Kim San, to design and carry out plans to attract investments, grow the economy, and create prosperity and jobs. As he said, I settled the political conditions so that tough policies could be executed. However, Mr. Lee was also clear that while the development of the economy is very important, equally important is the development of the nature of our society. So he built an inclusive society where everyone enjoyed the fruits of progress. Education became the foundation for good jobs and better lives. HDB New Town sprung up one after another. Queenstown, Tuapayo, Ang Mo Kyo, to be followed by many more. We had roofs over our heads and we became a nation of homeowners. With Mr. Devon Nair and the NTUC, he transformed the union movement into a positive force, cooperating with employers and with the government to improve the lot of workers. Mr. Lee cared for the people whom he served, the people of Singapore. When SARS struck in 2003, he worried about taxi drivers whose livelihoods were affected because tourists had dried up and he pressed us hard for ways to find, to find ways to help the taxi drivers. Mr. Lee also cared for the people who served him. One evening, just a few years ago, he rang me up. One of my mother's WSOs, women's security officers, was having difficulty conceiving a child, and he wanted to help her. And he asked me whether I knew how to help her to adopt a child. So Mr. Lee was concerned for people not just in the abstract, but personally and individually. Internationally, Mr. Lee raised Singapore's standing in the world. He wasn't just a perceptive observer of world affairs, but a statesman who articulated Singapore's international interests and enlarged our strategic space. At crucial turning points, from the British withdrawal east of Suez to the Vietnam War to the rise of China, his views and counsel influenced thinking and decisions in many capitals. In the process, he built up a wide network of friends in and out of power. He knew every Chinese leader from Mao Zedong and every US president from Lyndon Johnson. He established close rapport with President Suharto of Indonesia, one of our most important relationships. Others he knew included Teng Xiaoping, Margaret Thatcher, Helmut Schmidt, George Schultz, as well as President Bill Clinton and Henry Kissinger, whom, who we are honoured to have here with us this afternoon. They all valued his candour and his insight. As Mrs, Mrs Thatcher said, Mr Lee had a way of penetrating the fog of propaganda and expressing with unique clarity the issues of our time and the way to tackle them. He was never wrong. And hence, despite being small, Singapore's voice is heard and we enjoy far more influence on the world stage than we have any reason to expect. Mr Lee didn't blaze this path alone. He was the outstanding leader of an exceptional team a team which included Go King Sui, Esra Jalatnam, Osman Wok, Hon Sui Sen, Lim Kim San, To Chin Chai, Ong Pang Boon, Devon Nair, and quite a number more. They were his comrades, and he never forgot them. 
So it's very good that Mr. Ong Pangbun is here today with us to speak about Mr. Lee later on. Thank you, Mr. Ong. Mr. Lee received many accolades and awards in his long life, but he wore them lightly. When he received the freedom of the City of London in 1982, he said, I feel like a conductor at a concert, bowing to applause, but unable to turn around and invite the accomplished musicians in his orchestra to rise and receive the ovation for the music they have played. For running a government is not unlike running an orchestra, and no Prime Minister ever achieves much without an able team of players. Because he worked with a strong team and not alone, because people knew that he cared for them and not for himself, and because he had faith that Singaporeans would work with him to achieve great things, Mr. Lee won the trust and confidence of Singaporeans. The pioneer generation who had lived through the crucial years had a deep bond with him. I once met a lady who owned a successful fried rice restaurant. She told me, tell Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, I will always support him. I was born in 1948, and I'm 48 years old. This year was 1996. There was some issue then, and this question had come up. I know what he has done for me and Singapore. She and her generation knew that, to use a Chinese phrase, if you follow Lee Kuan Yew, you will survive. Mr. Lee imbued Singapore with his personal traits. He built Singapore to be clean and corruption-free. His home was Spartan, his habits were frugal. He wore the same jackets for years and patched up the worn bits instead of buying new ones. He imparted these values to the government. And even when old and frail, on his 90th birthday, when he came to Parliament and MPs celebrated his birthday in Parliament, he reminded them that Singapore must remain clean and incorruptible and that MPs and ministers had to set the example. He pursued his ideas with tremendous and infectious energy. He said of himself, I put myself down as determined, consistent, persistent. I set out to do something, I keep on chasing it, until it succeeds. That's all. Easy to say, very few do it. And this was how he seized opportunities, seeing and realizing possibilities that many others missed. So it was he who pushed to move Paya Lebar Airport to Changi. It was he who rejected the then conventional wisdom that MNCs were rapacious and exploitative and he wooed foreign investments from MNCs personally to bring us advanced technology, to bring us overseas markets, to create for us good jobs. He wasn't afraid to change his mind when a policy was no longer relevant. When he saw that our birth rates were falling below replacement more than 30 years ago, he scrapped the stop at two policy and started encouraging couples to have more children. Having upheld a very conservative approach to supervising our financial sector for many years, he eventually decided the time had come to rethink and liberalize, but to do so in a controlled way. And this was how Singapore's financial center took off in a new wave of growth to become what it is today. He was always clear what strategy to follow, but never so fixed to an old strategy as to be blind to the need to change course when the world changed. Nothing exemplifies this better than water security, which was a lifelong obsession of his. He entrenched the PUB's two water agreements with Johor in the separation agreement. He personally managed all aspects of our water talks with Malaysia. 
He launched water-saving campaigns. He built reservoirs. He turned most of the island into water catchment to collect the rain to process to use. He cleaned up the Singapore River and Kalang Basin. He dreamed of the marina barrage long before it became feasible and persevered for decades until finally technology caught up and it became feasible and it became a reality. And he lived to see it become a reality. When PUB invented new water and desalination became viable, he backed these new technologies enthusiastically. So the result today is Singapore has moved towards self-sufficiency in water, become a leader in water technologies, and turn a vulnerability into strength. So perhaps it's appropriate that today, for his state funeral, the heavens opened and cried for him. Greening Singapore was another of his passions. On travels, when he came across trees or plants that might grow well here, he'd collect saplings and seeds and hand carry them back home. He used the Istana grounds as a nursery and would personally, personally check on the health of the trees, not just in general, but individual particular trees. If they had names, he would know their names. He knew that the names of the scientific names. Singapore's Prime Minister was also the chief gardener of the city in a garden. He had a relentless drive to improve and continued to learn well into old age. At 70, to write his memoirs, he started learning how to use his computer. Every so often, he would call me for help sometimes late at, late at night, and I would give him a phone consultation and talk him through the steps, how to save a file, how to find a document which has vanished somewhere on his hard drive. And if he couldn't find me, he would consult my wife. He made a ceaseless effort to learn Mandarin over decades. He listened to tapes of his teacher talking, conversing with him. Every day, in the morning while shaving at home, in the evening while exercising at Sri Tamasi. And he kept up his Mandarin classes all his life. Indeed, his last appointment on the 4th of February this year, before he was taken gravely ill early the next morning, was with his Mandarin tutor. He inspired all of us to give up our best. And he was constantly thinking about Singapore. At one National Day rally in 1988, he declared, even from my sick bed, even if you are going to lower me into the grave and I feel something is going wrong, I will get up. And he meant that. Indeed, even after he left the cabinet, occasionally he would still raise with me issues which he felt strongly about. During the budget debate two years ago, almost exactly two years ago, MPs hotly debated the cost of living, public transport, and so many other matters then preoccupying Singaporeans. Mr. Lee felt we had lost sight of the fundamentals that underpinned our survival. He emailed me. He sent me a draft speech. He told me he wanted to speak in the chamber to remind Singaporeans of these unchanging hard truths, what our survival depended upon. But I persuaded him to leave the task to me and my ministers, and he took my advice. But his biggest worry was that younger Singaporeans would lose the instinct for what made Singapore tick. And this was why he continued writing books into his 90s. Bilingualism, hard truths, one man's view of the world, and at least one more guided by him still in the process of being written on the history of the PAP. Why did he do this? So that a new generation of Singaporeans could learn from his experience and understand what their security, prosperity, and future depended upon. 
One of Mr. Lee's greatest legacies was preparing Singapore to continue beyond him. He believed that the leader's toughest job was ensuring succession. So he systematically identified and groomed a team of successors. He made way for Mr. Goh Chok Tong to become Prime Minister after him, but stayed on in Mr. Goh's cabinet to help the new team succeed. He provided stability and experience and quietly helped to build up Mr. Goh's authority. He knew how to guide without being obtrusive, to be watchful while letting the new team develop its own style, its own authority. He described himself like a mascot, but everyone knew how special this mascot was and how lucky we were to have such a mascot. And it was likewise when I took over. Mr. Goh became senior minister, Mr. Lee became minister mentor. A title which he felt reflected his new role. Not in command, but advice not to be taken lightly. Increasingly, he left policy issues to us, but he would share with us his reading of world affairs and his advice on major problems which he saw over the horizon. Some other prime ministers told me that they couldn't imagine what it was like to have two former PMs in my cabinet. But I told them it worked, both for me and for Singapore. For all his public duties, Mr. Lee also had his own family. My mother was a big part of his life. They were a deeply loving couple. She was his loyal spouse and confidant, going with him everywhere, fussing over him, helping with his speeches, and keeping home and hearth warm. They were a perfect team and wonderful parents. When my mother died, he was bereft. He felt the devastating loss of a lifetime partner, who, as he said, had helped him to become what he was. My father left the upbringing of the children largely to my mother, but he was the head of the family and he cared deeply about us, both when we were small and long after we had grown up. He wasn't very demonstrative, much less was he touchy-feely. So not new age, but he loved us deeply. After my first wife, Ming Yang, died, my parents suggested that I try meditation. They gave me some books to read, mindfulness, tranquility meditation. I read the books, but I didn't make much progress. I think my father had tried meditation too, also not too successfully. His teacher told me later that when he told Mr. Lee to relax, still his mind and let go, he replied, but what will happen to Singapore if I let go? When I had lymphoma, he suggested that I try meditation more seriously. He thought it would help me to fight the cancer. He found me a teacher, spoke to him personally, and with a good teacher to guide me, I made better progress. In his old age, after my mother died, my father started meditating again, and this time with help from Ng Kok Song, whom he knew from GIC. Kok Song brought a friend to see my father. The friend was a Benedictine monk who did Christian meditation. My father was not a Christian, but he was happy to learn from a Benedictine monk. And he even called me to suggest that I meet the monk, which I did. He probably felt I needed to resume meditation too. And to give you some context, this was a few months after the 2011 general election. <laughs> I was by then nearly 60, and he was by then nearly 90. But to him, I was still his son to be worried over, and to me, he was still a father to love and appreciate, just like when I was small. So this morning, before the ceremonies began at Parliament House, we had a few minutes. I sat by him 
and meditated. Of course, growing up as my father's son could not but mean being exposed to politics very early. I remember as a little boy, I knew his constituency was Tanjong Paga. I was proud of him becoming legal advisor to so many trade unions, and I was excited by the hubbub at Oxley Road whenever elections happened and our home became the election office. I remember when we were preparing to join Malaysia in the early 60s, going along with my father on constituency visits, the Fang Wen tours which he made to every corner of Singapore. For him, it was back-breaking work, week after week, every weekend, rallying the people's support for a supremely important decision about Singapore's future. For me, these were not just Sunday outings, but also an early political education. I remember election night in 1963, the crucial general election when the PAP defeated the pro-communist Barisan Socialist. My mother sent me to bed early, but I lay awake in bed to listen to the election results until the PAP had won enough seats to form the government again. And then I think I fell asleep. I remember the day he told me while we were playing golf at the Istana, that should anything happen to him, he wanted me to look after my mother and my younger brother and sister. I remember the night the children slept on the floor in my parents' bedroom at Tamasi House in Kuala Lumpur. Because the house was full of ministers who had come up from Singapore, and every so often my father would get up from bed to make a note about something before lying down to rest again, but obviously he wasn't asleep. And the date was 7th of August, 1965, two days before separation. Growing up with my father, living through those years with him, made me what I am. This year is the 50th anniversary of Singapore's independence. We all wanted Mr. Lee to be present with us on August the 9th to celebrate this milestone. More than anybody else, it was he who fought for multiracialism, which ultimately led to our independence as a sovereign republic. It was he who united our nation, built our people, built, united our people, built a nation, and made our 50th anniversary worth celebrating. Sadly, it is not to be. But we can feel proud and happy that Mr. Lee lived to see his life's work come to fruition. At last year's National Day Parade, when Mr. Lee appeared and waved, and it appeared on the big screen, on the floating platform, the crowd gave him the most deafening cheer of the whole parade. Last November, the People's Action Party celebrated its diamond anniversary at the Victoria Concert Hall, where Mr. Lee founded the party 60 years ago. Party members were so happy to see that Mr. Lee could be there, they gave him a rousing, emotional standing ovation those of us who were there will never forget it. St. Paul's Cathedral in London was built by Sir Christopher Wren, a famous architect. He was the architect of the cathedral, and he's buried in the cathedral, which was his masterpiece. There's a Latin ap epitaph on his grave, and it reads, See monumentum requiris circumspice. It means, if you seek his monument, look around you. Mr. Lee Kuan Yew built Singapore. To those who seek Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's monument, Singaporeans can reply proudly, look around you.
Now let me continue in Malay and then Mandarin. Saudara -saudari Fellow Singaporeans, we have lost a leader who had guided us, inspired us, united us, and laid the foundation for our success. This includes the racial harmony that we have been enjoying all this while. It is the result of Mr. Lee's deep commitment to strengthen interracial and interreligious ties among the different races and religions in Singapore, a vision that is also strongly supported by the Malays. Mr. Lee deeply appreciated the solid support of the Malays for his vision and the PAP, especially when Singapore was still part of Malaysia. Without the support of the Malays then, it is highly likely that Singapore today would have turned out differently. So when Singapore gained independence, Mr. Lee was determined to ensure that the minorities have their place in Singapore forever. His commitment in helping the Malay Muslim community to progress was apparent. He laid the foundation for the formation of the Mosque Building Fund so that the community could build mosques in every housing estate through contributions from every working Muslim. Mr. Lee also believed that education is the main key to uplift the Malay community. For this reason, he strongly supported the setting up of the Mandaki Foundation to help needy Malay students and families. While we are saddened by Mr. Lee's departure, let us honour and celebrate his spirit and contributions. Let us continue efforts to develop Singapore, strengthen our multiracial and multireligious society, and work together as one united people, just as Mr. Lee fought for all his life. Singapore's development and success were, in were in inextric inextricably linked to Mr. Lee's personality and ideals. If Mr. Lee and his colleagues had chosen a different path or did not have the vision and determination to fight for and defend Singapore's independence, Singapore would definitely not be what it is today. Mr. Lee gave his all and worked hard to build Singapore. His motto was, for Singapore to continue to thrive, we must always be vigilant and never rest on our laurels. We have to apply wisdom and creativity and keep persevering to continually remake Singapore. Then this island state can safeguard its interests, be relevant to the world and be recognized internationally. Mr. Lee devoted his whole life to serving the nation and realized his lifelong aspiration to build a rugged society and a vibrant nation. In his twilight years, he was heartened to see Singapore's continued stability, prosperity and growth even after he had stepped down. A humble and keen learner, Mr. Lee was a model of lifelong learning. In fact, he was attending his regular Mandarin lesson on the very night before he was last admitted to hospital. Mr. Lee was blessed with a happy family and a loving marriage. He and the late Madam Kwa Gyok Chu were loving couple. His three children have successful careers and are contributing to society. In his later years, he was fortunate to enjoy his grandchildren's company. 
While we grieve for the loss of our founding prime minister, we are also deeply grateful that he had led Singapore on its remarkable journey, which has now entered its 50th year. As we remember him, let us not forget his vision for Singapore, his love for this country. Let us carry on his perseverance and dedication to continue the Singapore miracle. So that Mr. Lee will not have to worry about his future. May he rest in peace. I said, the light that has guided us all these years has been extinguished. But that's not quite so. For Mr. Lee's principles and ideals continue to invigorate this government and to guide our people. His life will inspire Singaporeans and others for generations to come. Mr. Lee once said that we intend to see that Singapore will be here a thousand years from now, and that's your duty and mine. Mr. Lee has done his duty and more. It remains our duty to continue his life's work, to carry the torch forward and keep the flame burning bright. Over the past month, the outpouring of good wishes, prayers and support from Singaporeans as Mr. Lee lay ill has been overwhelming and even more so since he passed away on Monday. People of all races, from all walks of life, young and old, here and abroad, have mourned him. Hundreds of thousands queued patiently for hours in the hot sun and through the night to pay respects to him at the Parliament House. I visited the queue on the Padang. Many Singaporeans, not so few non-Singaporeans, who came out of deep respect and a sense of compulsion that here was a man they wanted to do honour to. Many more wrote heartfelt messages and took part in tribute ceremonies at community sites all over the island. Thousands of overseas Singaporeans gathered in our embassies and consulates to remember Mr Lee. And later in this funeral service, all of us in this hall across our island and in far-flung lands will observe a minute of silence, say the National Pledge, and sing Majula Singapura together. We have all lost a father. We grieve as one people, one nation. But in our grief, we've displayed the best of Singapore. Ordinary people going to great lengths to distribute refreshments and umbrellas to the crowd and help one another in the queue late into the night. Citizen soldiers, home team officers, cleaners, all working tirelessly round the clock. Our shared sorrow has brought us together and made us stronger and more resolute. We come together not only to mourn, we come together also to rejoice in Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's long and full life and what he has achieved with us, his people, in Singapore. We come together to pledge ourselves to continue building this exceptional country. Let us shape this island nation into one of the great cities in the world, reflecting the ideals he stood for, realizing the dreams he inspired, and worthy of the people who have made Singapore a home and nation. Thank you, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. May you rest in peace.
the President will now deliver his eulogy. Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong and the family of the late Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, Excellencies, distinguished guests, friends and fellow Singaporeans. On behalf of all Singaporeans, my wife Mary and I convey our deepest condolences to Prime Minister Lee and the family of the late Mr. Lee Kuan Yew on Mr. Lee's passing. Today, Singapore bids farewell to our country's first Prime Minister, the founder of our modern republic. As a nation, we mourn a man who made a difference, a man who shaped our very identity as a society, a man who was devoted to ensuring that Singapore succeeded where no one thought we could. But we do not mourn alone. Mr. Lee's impact stretched far beyond our shores. He raised the profile of our republic, earning respect and admiration around the world. On behalf of Singapore, I thank the many friends of Mr. Lee, friends of Singapore, who have traveled great distances to be with us today. Two years ago, I asked to visit Mr. Lee to see how he was doing. With Mr. Lee's increasing frailty and out of respect, I plan to meet him at his office. Mr. Lee, however, was adamant that he should come to my office. It took him a great deal of effort, but he did it as a mark of respect for the office of the President. This incident was more than a matter of protocol. To me, it demonstrated Mr. Lee's strong regard for our constitution, for the institutions of our state. And even though he played a lead role in creating these institutions, he also knew that they had to be greater than any one man. It is often said that Singaporeans are a pragmatic people, and we are, but we are also fundamentally a nation built on ideals. Mr. Lee once said, each generation is fired by its own vision of the ideal society in the ideal world. The ideal can never be achieved, but because men have ideals, those societies progress. Mr. Lee's ideals were clear. He believed in them and he lived them. Meritocracy, honesty, integrity. When Mr. Lee became Prime Minister in 1959, he pulled together a strong team of leaders from diverse backgrounds. He ensured that positions in government were filled by the most capable people rather than those with connections or money. 
Mr. Lee took severe measures to curb corruption, a root cause of inequality. He put in place tough laws to investigate those suspected of corruption and heavy penalties for those caught taking bribes. By ensuring that our government and economy stayed honest, accountable, and free of corruption, Mr. Lee assured investors and companies that Singapore was the right place for their investments. Companies from around the world came and continue to come to Singapore, creating opportunities for employment, learning, and growth for Singaporeans. Mr. Lee demanded, without compromise, complete integrity in personal and professional matters from himself, his family, and his colleagues. He said in Parliament in 1979, the moment key leaders are less than incorruptible, less than stern in demanding high standards, from that moment, the structure of administrative integrity will weaken and eventually crumble. To make sure that our public services were working well to serve the people, he made unannounced visits to inspect our HDB estates, hospitals, parks, and other public places. Integrity, however, was more than the basis for a strong economy and a capable government. Mr. Lee had a vision of Singapore as a fair and a just society. Today, all Singaporeans have the opportunity to contribute to and benefit from Singapore's development, regardless of race or religion, connections, or family background. Through his personal example, Mr. Lee embedded a sense of integrity into our very identity as a nation. With integrity as our nation's bedrock, Mr. Lee forged a cohesive society that shares common values and experiences across races and religions. When Singapore gained independence, we were a fractured and divided society. This past week, Singaporeans from all walks of life came together to mourn the loss of Mr. Lee. Large numbers of Singaporeans queued patiently for hours to pay their last respects at Parliament House and community tribute sites across the island. Many individuals and businesses offered shelter and refreshments to those who have been waiting in line, lending a helping hand to fellow Singaporeans. This would have made Mr. Lee, very proud. This was what he had worked for his whole life, to build a united people who respect and care for one another as fellow citizens. Every National Day, we look forward to seeing Mr. Lee. I remember vividly our National Day Parade two years ago. There had been some uncertainty about Mr. Lee's health. While I was waiting to enter the floating platform to officiate the parade, suddenly I heard a huge roar, a, a cheer, the biggest that day. My staff informed me that Mr. Lee had just made 
his entrance to take his seat. That roar captured the feelings of a nation, of all of us towards Mr. Lee. It rang with respect, affection, friendship, and deep emotional attachment. It is not something that can be easily put into words. But I know that all Singaporeans in their hearts understand what I'm talking about. It was the song of one nation united. <clears throat> we will miss Mr. Lee at this year's National Day Parade. But he will be foremost in our minds and in our hearts. Over the past week, we have mourned the passing of a man and an era. There will never be another Lee Kuan Yew. No one person can take his place nor do what he did. But Mr. Lee believed passionately that Singapore had to be greater than any single individual. When Mr. Lee stepped down as Prime Minister a quarter of a century ago, he was still in good health. He had many more years to contribute, but he knew that Singapore would always be a work in progress, that each generation needs its own leaders. Now is the time for us to take up the torch to further the ideals upon which Singapore was built and to make them our own. There is a well-known saying, most famously used by Isaac Newton, and I quote, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants, unquote. We are held aloft by Mr. Lee and our founding generation. They have given us the foundation, the ability, and a confidence to look forward to the future to shape an even better Singapore for all Singaporeans. Together, we can respond to challenges. Together, we can create new opportunities for our children and grandchildren in Singapore. This is Mr. Lee's legacy for us. We must continue to pursue our ideals with courage and commitment. And so, I call on all Singaporeans to honour the memory of Mr. Lee by working together to achieve happiness, prosperity and progress for our Singapore. This will be our tribute to Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. Goodbye, Mr. Lee. May your soul rest in peace.
the Emeritus Senior Minister will now deliver his eulogy. Mr. President, family members of the late Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, friends. Mr. Lee Kuan Yew gave his life to us. To truly appreciate this, you had to have marched alongside him in his long political journey. Or study him closely, his words and actions, his ideas and vision, his values and philosophy or carried along by his passion in building a nation and improving the lives of Singaporeans, or lived his worries day in and day out. To Singaporeans, he was, he was our first Prime Minister, our leader who fought for our independence, the man who turned Singapore from third world to first, our national father. For me, he would always be my teacher. I first met Mr. Lee in 1958, when I went to his office to invite him to speak to my school. He was the leader of the opposition. Later, I nervously chaired the talk to a packed hall. That was my high point in school. Mr. Lee Kuan Yew was Singapore, but it surprised me that he had earned that accolade just two years after Singapore's independence. On a field trip with my class of international students to Puerto Rico in 1967, a Puerto Rican excitedly shouted, Chino, Chino, when he saw me. I shouted back, Singapore. He replied, Lee Kuan Yew. Mr. Lee drove his people hard because he had to toughen fledgling Singapore quickly. As he put it, he had to account for the lives of millions of Singaporeans. He rallied and united a disparate population to share a common identity. He braved necessary long-term painful policies. Farmers who resettled and land acquired, old malls and temples made way for public housing, roads and schools. Gangsters and drug traffickers were detained without trial. Some people alleged that these policies lacked compassion. But Mr. Lee taught people how to fish and brought fish to Singapore waters. He housed and schooled millions. He gave us safe streets and parks. He was a leader, not a populist politician. The outpouring of grief, gratitude and love for him says it all. People know that Mr. Lee did immense good for them. Mr. Lee consulted widely with colleagues and people he trusted. He told his backbenchers to bring out the people's concerns and gossip from the coffee shops and the hawker centres. Mr. Lee never muzzled anyone. But he robustly defended his convictions and Singapore's interests, very often to the discomfort of his critics. To those he believed were out to destroy Singapore, he put on his knuckle dusters. Mr. Lee was a good teacher. He was always scanning the future, anticipating challenges, preempting problems, and thinking out solutions. He shared with the cabinet useful articles, his conversations with world leaders, and insights from overseas trips. He studied best practices and explored innovative ideas for Singapore. Where there were no precedents, he thought out creative and innovative solutions. Mr. Lee was a worrier. He worried incessantly whether Singapore would survive after he and the old guard were gone. He wanted to be judged on this not by the city he had built and the lives he had improved. 
as Singapore prospered and hard times and history forgotten, he did not believe that able, committed and honest leaders would emerge naturally, unlike his generation who were born with fire in their bellies to fight for independence, multiracial equality and a fair and just society. And so Mr. Lee single-mindedly planned for leadership succession. He emphasized character, motivation, commitment, and ability over academic grades. He underlined the importance of having the moral authority to govern. In pushing for leadership renewal, he had to cut short the political careers of his old colleagues. This was painful for him. He said that it was emotionally difficult but necessary. I had to do it, whatever my own feelings. I know he felt for them. He would occasionally ask me about them. Learning from Mr. Lee, I too planned for leadership renewal. He was surprised when soon after the 2001 general election, I intimated my intention to step down. He told me that there was no hurry. I explained that Deputy Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong was already approaching 50. I wanted to give him a long runway to lead Singapore and develop the fourth generation leadership. After I took over as Prime Minister, Mr. Lee was punctilious in observing the protocol of my office. He made sure he arrived before me for all events. As I respected him as my elder and mentor, I told him to dispense with this practice at non-formal events. But he explained that it was important to observe this protocol. Otherwise, people might draw the wrong conclusion that he did not respect me and take the cue from there. I valued Mr. Lee's advice when he was senior minister in my cabinet. He sought to understand my thinking and objectives and suggest the refinements and sometimes alternatives to my policies and programs. But he always made it clear that the decision was mine to make. He was, as he put it, a resource and data bank. We lunched regularly. Our conversations never drifted far from his life's work. We shared many common concerns, including the emerging trend of income certification and social fragmentation. He worried about almost every aspect of Singapore. He never ceased sharing, and I kept on learning. Once in a while, he showed his soft side. We talked about our families and health. After Mrs. Lee's death, I glimpsed how lonely and sad he was. Sadly, we had to discontinue our lunches in 2013 because of his health. Sadly, his physical health declined. Sadly, Mr. Lee is gone. I cannot put his legacy more eloquently than his old guard comrade, the late S. Rajaratnam. He wrote, there is one monument which I think will bring warmth and comfort to him in the twilight years of his life. And that is a city and society which he, more than anybody else, has literally built out of nothing. The question today is not what Mr. Lee has done. What he has done is on record and indelible. But whether the city and society he has built will endure after he is gone, and how much of the past they will help shape the future, will be remembered and understood by succeeding generations. Mr. Lee has completed his life journey. He transformed our lives. He touched our hearts. We grieve. But I believe Mr. Lee would say, what to do? This is life. He would want us to move on with the Singapore story. 
He will want us to fight our own battles and conquer our own peaks. He would want Singapore to succeed. Long after he's gone, we must honour him. I've seen and heard many acts of kindness over the past week. Singaporeans helping those who need help, staying strong together, even as we mourn. This shared, compassionate moment is a people's tribute to Mr. Lee. Let us stay united across race and language, religion, across young and old, across rich and poor, across our whole society, to write an exciting sequel to his and our Singapore story. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Mr. Ong Pangbun, member of the first cabinet, will now deliver his eulogy. The first time I heard of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew was during the 1952 postal workers' strike. When I was a student at the University of Malaya, at the time, the English and Chinese papers reported widely on how this legal advisor representing the unions argued successfully against the colonial government for the unions and workers' welfare. Like many other young people, I was deeply impressed by this brilliant lawyer. So when the PAP decided to contest the 1955 election, I did not hesitate to support the PAP as a volunteer and was assigned to be Mr. Lee's election agent. But after the election, my employer posted me to Kuala Lumpur, and I thought that was the end of my political involvement. In 1956, Mr. Lee was en route to the Cameron Highlands for a holiday with his wife and eldest son and arranged to see me at the Kuala Lumpur Station Hotel. To my surprise, he asked me to join the PAP as its organizing secretary. I was determined to join the battle for independence from colonial rule and accepted his offer without a second thought and joined the March for Change. I have never regretted that decision. As the PAP's organizing secretary, I had to work closely with Secretary General Lee and other EXCO members. This gave me a better understanding of Mr. Lee. He was a consummate and far-sighted politician. Maximizing every opportunity to advance his political advantage and the PAP's interests. Although English educated, 
He understood that power rested with the pro-communist students from Chinese schools and the trade unions. Hence, he was always worried that the PAP could be hijacked by the pro-communists. We fought with the pro-communists several times in the early years, but we won because Mr. Li had the strong support of like-minded comrades like Dr. Tou Ching Chai, Dr. Go King Sui, and S. Rajaratnam. In 1959, the PAP won the general election on the back of the Chinese educated voters of Singapore. I joined the first PAP cabinet with Mr. Li as Singapore's first prime minister. He was a dedicated prime minister with broad perspectives. During cabinet meetings, there would sometimes be differing views on certain issues. But after active discussion, he was able to accept alternative views and ideas. I served in the cabinet until 1984. What struck me most about Mr. Li was his complete passion for Singapore. He spent every moment thinking of how he could improve Singapore and Singaporeans' lives. Once he decided that a certain policy was in the interest of his beloved Singapore, he would implement it, even if it meant making himself unpopular. There were critics who disagreed with Mr. Lee's policies. But I believe the man should be measured on the following considerations. First, everything Mr. Lee did was to make Singapore better. He could be forceful towards his political opponents and those who disagreed with him. But throughout his life, he was always wholeheartedly fighting for the best interest of this small and vulnerable nation. Second, without Mr. Lee, the Singapore story would be quite different. He was the lightning rod that galvanized the pioneer group of PAP leaders and grassroots supporters in our battles first against colonial rule and then the pro-communists and communalists. In short, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew was a far-sighted leader who had the courage to realize his vision. Without him, Singapore will not be what it is today. Mr. S. Danabalan, former cabinet minister, will now deliver his eulogy.
as one who worked closely with Mr. Lee Kuan Yew for a period, I want to focus on just four aspects of his leadership that remain with me. First, he had an absolute obsession to ensure an honest, corruption-free political process and public administration system. He had seen the damage a nation and society suffer when well-meaning leaders allow those close to them to take advantage of their position. Mr. Lee demanded and expected honesty and probity from political colleagues, from his equivalent of the Long March comrades, public servants, and from all members of his family. He was seen as a hard-hearted man who acted without feelings. But on the few occasions he discussed privately with me the decision to act against someone, I know that he agonized over the decision. He was convinced that a soft-hearted approach would undermine the ethos he wanted to embed deeply in public service. The second point is how he planned succession. What is still vivid in my mind is the time and mental energy he spent to prepare us for the responsibilities ahead. Much of the time in cabinet meetings was spent with him sharing his experience in politics, in policy making and policy implementation. He circulated and discussed critically essays and commentaries from journalists, journals and newspapers. When he made official visits and went to conferences, he always made it a point to take a few of us in the younger team along with him, to familiarize us with how to interact with the leaders of other nations and observe how to probe, get a better understanding of global events. He would always try to seek the relevance to Singapore of his as well as our observations. We were deeply sensitized to looking at everything in terms of what we could do in and for Singapore, or equally important, what we should avoid doing. Mr. Lee never tired of repeating his war stories, observations, and conclusions about events and personalities. To me, he was minister mentor from the time I started working with him. The third point is the way he took decisions. The myth is that he brooked no opposition to what he wanted and that the cabinet members merely fell in line. That was not my experience. He argued tirelessly to get cabinet to accept his views, not because it was the PM's view, but because of the strength of his arguments. I think he felt he had failed were he not able to convince his cabinet colleagues. When he spoke as prime minister at important occasions, he, spent, he sent drafts of his speeches to his colleagues for views and suggestions before he settled the final version. The idea that he expected his team to follow him like a herd of sheep without question completely misrepresents the man and his values. The last point concerns his reputation as the complete political pragmatist who did not allow idealism to get in the way of what would work in and for Singapore. He was a pragmatist, yet in a very deep sense, he was an idealist. He was obsessed with not only what would work in Singapore, but what the feel and timbre of our society should be. This is well illustrated by his approach to the language policy. In a population comprising 75% Chinese, the easiest way to ensure political support and electoral support would have been to champion Chinese language and behind that, Chinese chauvinism. He was convinced that for our nation to be distinct and different from other nations, we had to be multilingual with English as the main language of administration and commerce. But each racial group must maintain its cultural identity with the mother tongue as a second language. To convert Chinese schools into national type schools and push for Mandarin against Chinese dialects were the acts of an idealist, not the acts of a pra pragmatist. Today, we 
come to say oh, farewell to Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, who is in a complete sense the father of all Singapore that we know. Up to the very end, he was committed to this nation. In the words of Tennyson, though made weak by time and fate, he remained strong in will, determined not to rust unburnished, but to shine in use. Farewell, sir. Mr. Sidek bin Sanif, former Senior Minister of State, will now deliver his eulogy. When Mr. Lee asked me to stand as a candidate in the 1976 general elections, I was surprised. My decision to accept his offer to stand as a PAP candidate created quite a stir in the Malay community. Just a few years earlier, I had expressed differing views from the government about education. He was a tough taskmaster, but always full of advice. Never waffle, he would say. Be open, be attentive, firm. But above all, be polite. His advice was to concentrate on education. This would ensure our children would go on to become trustworthy trustees of our nation. When, he, when they grow up. I am most grateful to Mr. Lee for fully supporting the formation of the Mandaki Foundation. In 1979, when I was to accompany Hon Sui Sen, then Minister of Finance, to China, Mr. Lee asked me if I could take the cold Chinese winter. Do you have an overcoat? He asked. I said that I would buy one. No, don't waste money, he replied. Don't waste money. After pausing, he said, Ahmad Mata, Ahmad Mata has a good overcoat. Borrow from him. 
What about boots to cover your shoes for walking? I said, I didn't have any, but I would buy a pair. No, no, don't waste money. He paused, borrow from Chok Tong. So off I went to China with a borrowed overcoat and a borrowed pair of boots. Mr. Lee believed in frugality, both in his personal life as well as nationally. And he walked the talk. The episode is an example and also showed his fatherly character. and his fatherly character and sharp eye for detail. Speaking of not being wasteful, Mr. Lee disliked wasting time. He was not one to procrastinate. In 2010, when I presented him with a copy of my book, of speeches and news articles entitled The Singapore Malay Paradigm. He sent me a personal note of best wishes. A few days later, I felt touched by his gesture and replied that the book would not have been possible but for Mr. Lee's foresight. He responded on that very day itself with his own handwriting. He said, Thank you, Sidek. I had several opportunities to accompany him abroad when he traveled to Israel and Jordan in 1995, I was on the Singapore delegation. Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and Jordan's King Hussein both entertained us in their respective homes. This was a classic example of Jewish and Arab hospitality, utmost appreciation and respect being bestowed on our former Prime Minister, a respect tinted in gold. Fellow Singaporeans, today we register our deepest respect and appreciation to this great man. Mr. Lee was the embodiment of the term statesman, someone who comes along once every few decades to make an indelible mark on society and the world at large. 
To his family, the nation shares your sorrow that you feel. Please accept our heartfelt condolences. May you be consoled. In the knowledge that our founding father, your father, had lived a long and meaningful life. Singaporeans are indeed indebted to him. Let me recite a Malay Pantun or a short poem. This Malay quatrain means that monetary debts can be paid off, but debts of good deeds cannot be repaid. A person brings such debts to his grave. There is also a Malay saying, which means that a person who has done many great deeds will always be remembered. Mr. Lee, we would like to assure you that your legacy remains intact. We shall always cherish your advice, especially in governing. You said if you want to be popular all the time, you will misgovern. If you want to be popular all the time, you will misgovern. And you always urged us to be pragmatic. And above all, you insisted we remain honest and clean to characters that has deep, solid meaning. PM SM MM Farewell. Farewell, my friend. Farewell. Mr. G. Mutu Kumarasamy, trade unionist, will now deliver his eulogy. Singapore Munal Paradamatri Likwari Patri Singapore Rin Munna Silla Silla Varigale Avapati Pes. A few words about 
Singapore's former Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. Thank you for the opportunity given to me to say a few words. There is so much to talk about, Mr. Lee. Not only an outstanding human being, but an outstanding father as far as I know. When I first saw him, I was very proud. Today, I'm standing here not only as a labourer, but a trade unionist leader. That glory is credited to him. When I was young, my father would often tell me about Mr. Lee. Because of him, our Indian community has progressed. If not, none of them would stand on their own feet. Because during those days, my father used to say that most Indian families will not allow their women to work. There was a cultural boundary limiting only men to work. As such, it was very difficult for those families. Some children had to stop their studies halfway. How to manage the families in such a situation with single incomes, low income? Mr. Lee knew about this well. Upon knowing this, he wanted to pave a pathway for the Indian community. He announced, he asked Indian women to join the workforce and gave the assurance he wanted to protect the women who come home from work late in the night. Also, he announced the housing plans, encouraging people to allow women to work so that housing became affordable. Such fundamentals were formulated and many Indian women started going to work. That's why they are able to stand on their own feet. I am proud of it. If he didn't do that, then this would not have happened today. It's a big thing. It's a big glory. My father used to say this to me. After some time, after I finished my education, I went to work. I was an apprentice wireman at PWD. Many people told me, guess what they said? Our Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, is a person who gets angry very often. If he dislikes, he will fire someone. I was not bothered about it. I kept on doing my work. Once they brought me to work at Changi Cottage Holiday Bungalow. When we got there, we serviced the air conditioning system. We didn't know who is coming to stay in that bungalow. We went there because there was work to do. When I was servicing the aircon in that room, I suddenly saw Mr. Lee Kuan Yew enter the room. He gazed upon us. How will you feel? Previously, they warned us that he was a person who gets angry very often. We were scared. We couldn't do anything. Even then, we controlled our minds. We climbed down the ladder. He asked us, 
Have you finished the work? Yes, sir. Where is your supervisor? Outside. Bring him in. We brought him in. He told my supervisor, I asked you to do the job, not him. Now, do it in front of me. He was actually doing it. We were confused. We were worried that we had not done the job correctly. When we kept quiet, my reporting officer told me that he will tell me the meaning later. When everything was completed, Mr. Lee finished in one sentence. From now, I must not see you in Istana. I must not see you in Changi Holiday Bangalore. Look at how. Who will get this strictness? Only my father who has passed on, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. Till now, I think of him, of what my father said about him. We must live with a principle like him, a duty, commitment like him. His philosophy and principle doesn't disappear at any point of time. Only because he formulated things as such then, we are well off today. Also, he was a good father for all the unions. In one of his May Day speeches, he urged that employers must be such and employees must be such and the government must be such. All three forces must work in one way. You must sit down, discuss and implement. He taught us in detail. Who will teach us like that? Apart from teaching us the details, on that May Day speech, he urged the low-income workers to come forward and there are a lot of causes for them to come forward and learn and progress. He asked them to upgrade their skills. Many low-income workers, upon hearing his advice, did so. They became technicians, they became engineers, they learned handcraft skills. I was one of them, and I'm proud of that. If he didn't do that that day, we wouldn't have progressed today. All this glory goes to him, and I pray for that. Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, I pray to God for your soul to rest in peace. Mr. Leong Chun Lun and John Paga, community leader, will now deliver his eulogy.
Mr. President, family members of the late Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, friends, today we mourn the loss of the country's first Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. I have been a grassroots leader in Tanyong Paga constituency for 39 years. I'm privileged to be able to stand here today to pay tribute to Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. I consider him my leader and my friend. His departure not only is a loss for the country, but also a deep personal loss for myself. Having worked closely with him for so many years, I have developed a profound respect and admiration of Mr. Lee. I now wish to share with you some stories of my encounters with him, with this great man throughout these years. Back in the early days, in Chinese New Year celebration would kick off with lighting of firecrackers and follow with singing of the national anthem. And at a particular case, when the firecrackers has been lit, but they never go off. Getting a bit impatient, the MC decided to carry on and play the national anthem. But the moment that started, the firecracker went off luckily. So it sounded very funny at that time, but <laughs> the Mr. Lee was not amused at all. He told us later that if we can't even do these things right, how do we run the country? The incident showed us how serious he was about all things concerning Singapore and how he he always expected us to do our best. Mr. Lee cared for his people. As at the Tanyong Paga Family Day function, we had uh, set up a stage for the day's activities. The key officials were sitting on the stage and the resident was sitting in front of the stage. The place was hot and sunny. Mr. Lee noticed that residents are perspiring. And he turned around and asked, what are we going to do about it now? He was always thinking of about the people and he expected us to put all the interests our interest above should not put our interest above uh, the residents. At constituency dinner, Mr. Lee liked to sit with grassroots leaders so that he could talk to them. We would we have always been arranging the seating such that, as his own, that his old friends would be seated on road to his table. It would take him some time to get to his table as he would stop by to speak to every familiar faces. When Mr. Lee heard that the old friends were doing well, his face would light up with pride. 
Even though Mr. Lee is no longer with us, his legacy is something that we Singaporeans will always, always remember. Ms. Cassandra Chu, former journalist, will now deliver her eulogy. I didn't know Mr. Lee Kuan Yew personally for most of my life. We met while I was on two assignments as a journalist, documenting his life at home and collecting photographs for a picture book for his 90th birthday. I met him up close six times for meetings and interviews from July 2011. Most were large formal meetings at the Istana, and naturally, I was on my best behavior. After all, this was the man who had led Singapore to independence, triumphed over his opponents in a storied political career spanning over 60 years, and transformed a sleepy colonial outpost into a bustling metropolis. And there he was, in person. I didn't dare say a word to him until my editor made me lead one of the interviews. He thought Mr. Lee would enjoy the interaction with a younger Singaporean. I was so nervous, I could hear my heart pounding before the meeting and actually felt a headache coming on. I braced myself to be peppered with questions on whether I was married, <laughs> when I planned to have children, or whether I spoke Mandarin often enough. Questions Mr. Lee as you know, was known to ask young Singaporeans he met. But there was none of that during the 18-minute interview, which was focused on the beginnings of his political career. There was no room for nervousness either. He came in, sat down and asked, who's going to start? And with that, the interview began. As always, Mr. Lee was focused on the task at hand. Over time, I gained more glimpses of what he was like as a person. For instance, it was a thrill for me to learn from his oral history that he once failed an art exam in primary school. <laughs> but that was, of course, a small blemish on his distinguished academic record. I also learned that in his later years, he craved his late mother's gado gado and mee siam, which, thankfully, his sister, Madam Monica Lee, could replicate. I made at least eight visits to 38 Oxley Road, where I went into all the rooms. But the only time I saw him at home was during our 20-minute photo shoot, which began in his study, where he spent most of his time while at home. He was in good spirits that day, dressed in a white short sleeve shirt, dark trousers, and his trademark sport shoes. It looked as if he had been going through his email at his desk, which also had newspapers, magazines, binders of papers, and stationery, all neatly arranged. It was clear that even at home, his focus was on his work. It didn't matter to him that his furniture was more than 60 years old and outdated. They served their purpose, and that was all that mattered. That was how he lived his life, very simply and frugally, and always putting the country first and his own creature comforts second. 
We moved to the living room, which was also a very private space, because it was where the late Mrs. Lee was remembered. Her photographs were displayed in two rows above her urn, and I was told Mr. Lee would gaze at them daily as he had his meals. I could feel how much Mr. Lee missed his late wife. She was his partner, his anchor, for more than 63 years. The last set of photos we took at his home are my favorite. Seated on a chair by a wooden table on the veranda, Mr. Lee flashed a bright smile. They turned out to be the best photos on the reel. No one knows about this, but to thank him for the photo shoot that day, I had prepared two chocolate cupcakes after learning how much he enjoyed chocolate. I even got the bakery to label each cupcake so he'd know exactly what kind of chocolate cupcake it was. But on the day, I was far too excited and dropped the box before I could present them to Mr. Lee. I had been reflecting on what I was learning about Mr. Lee as a person and founder of Independent Singapore and had just begun to understand just how much he and his family had sacrificed to ensure Singapore's success. I realized how much I had taken for granted and how much more I had to thank him for. To me, Mr. Lee had transformed from an elderly statesman who our textbooks say did a lot for us, but didn't quite seem relevant to my daily life, to a man for whom I developed a deep sense of gratitude and appreciation. So much of Singapore began to make sense to me now that I had seen the world through his eyes. I decided to try to express my thanks again and wrote him a thank you card. I had so much to say, but didn't know how to say it and ended up writing four simple lines. A few weeks later, I received a reply. True to his personality, his response was brief and to the point. Thank you, he wrote, and signed off as LKY. I was thrilled to have heard back from him, but a little sad that I didn't convey what I felt in my heart. This is my last chance. Mr. Lee, thank you for everything. Some days, I cannot believe how fortunate I am to have been born a Singaporean. We don't have everything, but we have more than most because of your lifelong labor. On behalf of young Singaporeans everywhere, I'd like to say thank you. Mr. Lee Sien Yang will now deliver his eulogy for the family. Mr. President, Prime Minister, and members of the Cabinet, distinguished guests here to honour my father, my fellow Singaporeans and friends of Singapore. Singapore has lost the father to our nation. For my family, we have lost our beloved father and grandfather. We are bereft. I was born in 1957, 
And for as long as I can remember, Papa was a public figure. As a child, I was only vaguely aware that my father was an Orang Besar, or VIP in Malay. All little children must think their fathers are special. I do not remember when it dawned on me that he was not just my own special father and not just an ordinary Orang Besar. He was an extraordinary Orang Besar. Papa was immersed in his work for much of my childhood. In September 1998, he gave Fern and me our copy of his book, The Singapore Story. In it, he penned a note with a tinge of regret to Young and Fern while I was running around as I described in this book. You grew up while I was running around as I described in this book. Perhaps in different circumstances, he would have been a very successful businessman or an entrepreneur, but he chose to dedicate his life and to serve the people of Singapore and to build a better future for all. He wanted to ensure his three children had a normal childhood. He didn't want us to grow up with a sense of privilege and entitlement. As a teenager in secondary school, seeking to assert my independence, I would sometimes ride the public bus. Papa did not object, and my poor security officer had to follow me around the buses. When I was in junior college and keen on outdoor activities, my security officer had to shadow me as I trekked around Pulau Ubin, Pulau Tekong, and canoed around Singapore. But Papa's principles ensured that I had as normal a childhood as possible. And although I think I put out the security detail often. Family holidays were happy occasions. We were able to see more of Papa. We didn't go anywhere far away, posh or exotic. The government rest houses in Fraser's Hill, Cameron Highlands, and later Changi Cottage a small two-bedroom seaside bungalow that holds many precious memories for me. Even if once in a while the aircon there doesn't work and we have to call out for help. Golf was Papa's principal recreation and a passion. So golf featured prominently not only on vacations, but also after work in the evenings. The nine-hole course in the Istana grounds provided ample room for us children to find adventure while see golf. Both Long and I were sent for golf lessons. We learned to hit a long drive from the tee box, but neither of us really took to the game, and we stopped when we grew up. But eventually, Papa too prompted by Ling, gave up golf. And for exercise, he took to jogging, swimming, stationary cycling, as well as walking. He had read of the benefits of aerobic exercise. He had examined and accepted the evidence, and he had changed his old habits. Papa was like that, firm in his convictions, but open-minded enough to accept fresh evidence and to change, even to sacrifice something he loved and enjoyed, like golf. Like with much else that he had set his mind to do, Papa remained disciplined and exercised regularly, even to the last. In January 1973, when I was 15, Ling and I joined Papa and Mama on a trip to visit Long, who was at university in Cambridge. 
It was our first family holiday where we traveled so far away. On that trip, Papa and Mama took the family to Stratford-upon-Avon, Shakespeare's birthplace. We watched the Royal Shakespeare's Company's production of Coriolanus and toured the usual Shakespearean sites at Stratford. I had assumed that it was just Mama indulging her love for Shakespeare and trying to educate us whilst we were on vacation. But years later, when Papa wrote his memoirs, we realized the hidden meaning this visit held for my parents. They had married secretly in Stratford-upon-Avon in December 1947. When Fern and I married in 1981, Papa was keen to have us live with them at Oxley Road. Mama, perhaps because of her own difficulties living with in-laws as a new bride, and my wife Fern too had reservations. So upon marriage, Fern and I made a home of our own. When my brother Long's first wife, Ming Yang, died in late 1982, leaving Long with two very young children, the family felt the weight of the tragedy. Fern and I wanted to help the family hold together and create some happy occasions to continue to share. Although growing up, all our birthdays, including those of Papa and Mama, remained unmarked and uncelebrated, we began inviting the family to our home for Papa's and Mama's respective birthdays, for which I would cook a simple meal. At the time, the family included my father's father, Kong, Papa and Mama, Ling, Long and his two children. Papa loved a good steak, and he had a pranakan sweet tooth for desserts. Over time, the group grew larger, the grandchildren had views of their own, and they could be outspoken. They were often ready to engage with Papa on issues of the day. I recall one birthday dinner where Sheng Wu debated with his yeye till late, long after we had finished dinner, both sides wanting to ensure that the other understood his perspective and point of view. Whilst there have been public celebrations to mark my father's key birthdays, these small private family celebrations were a source of much joy to him and Mama. It was anticipated for months before and savoured in the memory for months after and was part of the ritual of each passing year. The arrival of grandchildren was also a source of great joy for Papa and Mama. Mama was traditional enough that she was thrilled that I had one son after another. But Papa, my sense is that Papa would have been equally delighted if Fen and I had had three daughters. When the grandchildren were little, Papa would love to have them playing around him as he exercised after work in the evenings. At weekends, he often took them out to the zoo, the bird park, the science centre, and other places where families would go. Our youngest son, Xiao, arrived long after all the other grandchildren, and long after they had given up hope of any more grandchildren. Papa was in his 70s and less active in public life, so he and Mama took this as a wonderful opportunity to enjoy their last grandchild. Many know how privileged Singaporeans are to have benefited from my father's contributions to building our nation. I know that growing up as his son, I have also been privileged to have witnessed what it means to be a good man, a good husband, a good father and grandfather. To Singapore and Singaporeans, 
Papa was at various times, PM, SM, MM. But whatever his office, he was actually always LKY. Even after he stopped being MM, people found it awkward to refer to him by anything other than this alphabet soup. But to his grandchildren, he was always Ye Ye. And to Fern and me, he was and will always be Papa. We will miss him dearly. This past week, my family and I have received a deluge of messages expressing appreciation for my fa father's life sometimes providing poignant memories of interactions with Papa. And although in life, Papa kept the two threads of public and private life apart and shielded Mama and the children from the glare of the media, in his passing, the two threads come together as we share the grief of loss. We have been overwhelmed by the outpouring of grief and affection. We have been touched beyond words by the many Singaporeans who have braved the elements to pay their last respect at all hours of the night and day. Young and old, on foot or aided by walking sticks, in push chairs or wheelchairs, you came to pay your last respects, to sign condolence books and to write messages. You posted touching tributes and poems online and waited patiently to greet his cortege as it passed. Please accept my family's inadequate but deep and heartfelt thanks. We know our loss is your loss too, and that the loss is deep and keenly felt. We are humbled that so many have come forward to demonstrate your affection for, respect of, and gratitude to my extraordinary father. A father we share with Singapore. Farewell, Papa. Prime Minister will now lay a wreath on behalf of the family. The President will now lay a wreath on behalf of the State.
Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the last post, followed by the observance of a minute of silence to pay our last respect to the late Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. Now recite the National Pledge together. We, the citizens of Singapore, pledge ourselves as one united people, regardless of race, language or religion, to build a democratic society based on justice and equality, so as to achieve happiness, prosperity and progress for our nation.
This marks the end of the state funeral service. Mr. Lee's cottage will leave for Monday crematorium for the private funeral service. With this, we end Media Corp's live coverage.